Happy Pride Month! It's hot as shit outside, oh my god. As a result, today we're going to make something that is equal parts delightfully refreshing, deliciously smooth, and LGBTQIA plus positive on today's episode of Mike's Hard Reviews, The Cosmopolitan. Hey there, hello there, welcome back to Mike's Hard Reviews. My name is Michael, I'm a bartender from Kalamazoo, Michigan, and hello especially to my fellow non-binary folks on this very happy first day of Pride or second day of Pride, if you are watching this on the day the video comes out. I'm filming it on the first. It's coming out the second. That's how that works. Today we're gonna to talk about The Cosmopolitan, a video sort of subject that I thought was going to be relatively easy to cover. And as it turns out, it's actually a really difficult thing to research. The Cosmopolitan was invented in 1985 by a bartender by the name of Cheryl Cook, who worked at The Strand in South Beach, Miami. Maybe. As it turns out, The Cosmopolitan, as we know it, and who popularized it, who came up with it, is a pretty soundly debated topic. <laughs> there are a couple of different names that come up. Of course, Dale DeGroff is one of them. Uh, at the time, he was working at the Rainbow... Rainbow Road? Rainbow something? at uh, In New York. And he, he's been potentially said to have made it. Uh, there's another bartender who worked at Odeon in New York in 1988 by the name of uh, Toby Caccini, and he is the one that many people think came up with it. Uh, he, in fact, has, like, dates and, like, a bunch of stuff to back it up. Uh, so maybe it was him. Maybe it was Cheryl. A lot of people think it was Cheryl. I personally subscribe to that, uh, mostly because other cocktail historians, one in particular by the name of Gary Reagan, did the research to figure out the history of the cocktail and it led back to her, so I don't know. It's kind of anyone's guess who came up with this and it's a pretty debated subject, but I'm going to lean into the fact that Cheryl Cook came up with it. Cheryl Cook is working at this bar, The Strand, in Miami, and it's the 80s, so vodka is king. People fucking loved vodka in the 80s and 90s, and I don't understand why, really, but they did. And as a result, vodka cocktails were super popular. It was around this time, too, that companies started to produce, to produce flavored vodkas, the first of which being lemon-flavored vodkas, in the case specifically uh, Absolute Citron, which is Absolute's lemon-flavored vodka. It was a new thing to market, and it was something that, you know, bartenders and mixologists wanted to play with, and in the spur-of-the-moment decision to make up a variation on a drink called a kamikaze, which is a vodka-based margarita, Cheryl goes ahead and devises a riff of that using citron vodka and cranberry juice. Apparently it stuck, it was super popular, and became super well known, not just in gay clubs, which is where it was particularly popular at the time, uh, but around the, around the states and eventually around the world, because uh, of all things, HBO decided to sort of proliferate it. <laughs> HBO had this show in the 90s called Sex and the City, and in that show, the characters drink a lot of Cosmopolitans. It's the cocktail that they all seem to enjoy the most. And because of that, uh, it became incredibly popular. In the mid-90s, the Cosmopolitan was so common that it was really, really likely that whatever bar you went to, they had already shaken up dozens of them by the time you got there at like 10.30. The idea behind the cocktail was um, this sort of group of drinks called teenies, like short for martini, and that's disingenuous because they're actually sours. Uh, a teeny, like an apple teeny or a cosmopolitan, um, are not actually martinis, they are sours with vodka bases. So while you would call like a whiskey sour just a sour, uh, you would call like a gin sour a sour, you would call a vodka sour a teeny. It's a really weird sort of, you know, mixological destination to land at, but it was named after the glassware that it was supposed to be in, martini glasses, which apparently people really liked to the point that they just wanted to order a drink that came in a martini glass. Anyway, enough rambling. Let's go ahead and make ourselves a Cosmopolitan because it's really hot in here because I can't have the AC on while I'm doing this. And I really want something cold to drink. So let's make a Cosmopolitan. To do that, we're going to need a lemon flavored vodka. Typically speaking, um, this would be absolute. That's the one that, you know, came first and everybody wanted to use, uh, but any of them will work. It does not make a significant difference. We'll also need triple sec, some lime juice, and specifically cranberry juice cocktail. Not 100%. It's going to be too bitter if you do that. You really do need the cocktail, like ready to drink juice variety of cranberry juice. I'm going to be using the spec uh, listed on liquor.com because even though that's not how I build my Cosmos, it is pretty easy to follow and makes a lot of sense. Now that's also not the IBA or International Bartenders Association version of a Cosmo, so 
I don't really know what spec to use here. Um, Toby Caccini uses a 2111 spec for all the ingredients, and I think that makes a lot of sense too, but I'm just gonna follow what was listed there because it makes sense and it's familiar to a lot of people. Anyway, let's get making this drink. First up, we're going to need three quarters of an ounce of lime juice, three quarters of an ounce of Cointreau or triple sec of your preferred variety, just half an ounce of our cranberry juice cocktail. It's only there for a little bit of tartness and mostly just the color. And finally, one and a half ounces of our lemon flavored vodka. We're gonna add some ice to chill and dilute this with and then serve it in a coupe martini glass. Like always, we are going to stick with our one cube hole and one cube cracked method. Get to cap that up, tap it down, and shake for 12 to 15 seconds. Now I kind of misspoke. Um, technically speaking, these are supposed to be served in martini glasses. That was their appeal back in the day. Um, I think that's kind of antiquated now. Martini glasses are meant for martinis. They're very specific, that's why they're called that. So I'm going to use these newer sort of tall coupes that I just got at the store uh, earlier today, actually, because I thought they were really pretty and I think they'll suit this drink pretty well. I'm gonna grab our strainer and just pour that directly in to catch the pulps. Look at that color. Look at that color, aren't they so pretty? It's beautiful. <laughs> to finish this off with a garnish, we're gonna go ahead and cut ourselves a lime wheel like so. Sorry you had to see that. To finish it, we're gonna garnish that with a lime wheel just perked up right there on the rim. And then we have a Cosmopolitan, which I had to remake, which felt great. All right, in uh, what is becoming a steadily more and more common thing on this show, uh, I have cleaned up the bar space more thoroughly than normal this time. And now we can have a sip of our Cosmopolitan. Cheers. That's not bad. Drier than I think I like my Cosmos, but that's not bad. I do quite like that. It's got this nice light uh, citrusiness to it that's chiefly the, uh, the lime. It's really loud because there's not a lot going on to sort of mitigate it other than the sweetness from our base spirit and the flavor of the cranberry juice, plus a little bit of this, like, and really the most of the sweetness is coming from the Cointreau, actually. But Cointreau, despite being a liqueur, is actually considered a more bitter orange liqueur. Not like an Aperol, per se, but uh, something that does have enough sweetness to it to combat, you know, the power, the powerful nature of citrus. Here, it's a lot less sort of pulled back or restrained, and it's kind of proudly, like, loud in the cocktail, which is not bad. It is ice cold, which is awesome right now. It's so hot in here. <laughs> and it's just like perfectly, it's, I would describe it as like a perfectly fruity, perfectly fruity um, drink. It's It's got just the right amount of cranberry in there to first of all be that beautiful color of pink that you look for in a Cosmo. And to also have enough cranberry flavor and tartness to sort of change the drink away from being just loud, blatant citrus in your face and to being more like, oh yes, I'm tart, I'm here. I am sophisticated enough to stand up against other sours, but fun enough to, to have at the club, which is perfect and actually a really big part of what the drink was back in the day. That's the Cosmo. I honestly, I haven't made one in a while. I don't use this spec usually. Um, typically I'll use, you know, one and a half ounces of, uh, you know, flavored vodka one ounce of Cointreau, half an ounce of lime juice, half an ounce of 100% cranberry juice, and then half an ounce of simple syrup, um, which I think is a bit more rounded, a bit more full body. This is a little bit more thin, but still really, really good. <laughs> That's fantastic. I think this is really good. And I'm probably gonna have a couple of them today because it's hot and I got that off the day off work. So I'm pretty happy to do that. <laughs> Well, so yeah, I mentioned at the top of this that this was actually a really weird video to research because it was all over the place. The history was like, it was this person, it was this person, it's this person, and this person is really confident it was them and is kind of an asshole about it. <laughs> I really don't have time to go into everything that happened with trying to figure out who came up with this cocktail because it was so ubiquitous, everyone wanted to know. Um, and I don't really need to because Punch Magazine, which you can find the link to in the description down below, has already done that and has done all the work to sort of figure out who came up with this idea. They came to the conclusion overall that it was Toby Caccini, 
1988 at the Odeon Bar, which he then moved it over to the Rainbow Club uh, in New York, um, and that whole thing. I, I mean, it feels a little too comfy for me to him to just have all these dates like worked out and kind of planned. Cheryl's story feels more natural, which is why I'm gonna say this is a Cheryl Cook cocktail, but whatever, it's not that relevant. The thing is, it doesn't really matter uh, if either of them came up with it because likely neither of them had an original idea. <laughs> There's a cocktail that appears in a 1934 cocktail book called a Cosmopolitan Daisy, which is a variation on a Daisy, a gin sour cocktail using liqueur for its sweetness. And it does the exact same thing. Berry, gin, lemon, citrus, orange, or uh, excuse me, lemon, in that case, I think actually. And it accomplishes literally a very, 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 very similar cocktail using a couple different ingredients. It's raspberry instead of cranberry. And you know, there's a sort of an older technique to it, but it's a really, really similar cocktail in profile and construction, which makes a lot of people think, hey, this cocktail is not that original. They are different enough for me to say, hey, that's not really where that goes, but hey, you know, whatever. Uh, finally, I want to leave you with the note, uh, a more sort of carefully played out note, um, that gay clubs are the reason why this drink made its way around the world initially. <laughs> I believe it was in Provincetown, which is somewhere on the East Coast, I think Massachusetts, uh, somewhere on the East Coast, like around that area. Uh, and it, it was a drink made up in gay clubs, gay people, brought it around the world to the West Coast where it was popularized and riffed upon and eventually specs were made that people fell in love with and it was picked up and ran with. This cocktail is to a certain extent synonymous with the gay community. And to that, I will happily raise a toast to everybody celebrating Pride Month along with me. It's really fascinating to sort of come into this video having like two re research this like two days in advance of filming and discovered, oh, hey, I'm doing this at literally the perfect time. This sort of, this cocktail is synonymous with the gay civil rights movement um, and is a product of that community uh, to some extent. And that's fucking awesome and perfect. And hopefully all of you can go out and enjoy Pride and have a couple of these while you do it. So thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video of Mike's Art Reviews, click that like button down below and subscribe to catch another episode. I make a new one of these videos every single Friday and sometimes on Tuesdays, which is gonna become a more common thing. I'm working some new stuff out. Um, so we'll see how that goes. If you want to, you can follow me on all of my socials, which are appearing on the screen in front of you right now. Uh, I am not super active on them. Primarily, I'm trying to become active on TikTok. I like video platforms. Uh, I'm not a super huge fan of text-based platforms. So. IG is like third, uh, second is TikTok, YouTube is obviously first. So follow me wherever you want and just expect that I might not always be active. All that said though, thank you all so much for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed this and hopefully everybody out there has a really happy pride. As a non-binary bisexual person, I am really happy to, you know, be happily celebrating this for one of the first times in my life. And I hope all of you have a fantastic month uh, relishing in who you are and loving yourself and each other for what we all can be together. Um, thank you all so much for watching. Remember, you guys have a great rest of your afternoon, and in this case, a fantastic month. Remember to drink responsibly, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye-bye. I almost forgot. This episode's the first, um, because, ignore that, that's been there the whole time. Oh shit. This episode's the first because if you follow me on TikTok, you saw, or saw the short I put up a little while ago, you saw me talk about this book here, Crisp Toasts by uh, Andrew Frothingham and uh, William Evans. It's a book from 1992, I think, uh, filled with toasts for different uh, events, all of different themes. And I wanted to start reading a different toast at the end of every episode, starting with the next episode, like full episode of the show I made. So we need to read one of our crisp toasts today. I've, I've elected to go uh, alphabetical so that I can follow my place and uh, we won't do any of them, you know, twice by accident by choosing ra randomly. The book begins with a section on absent friends. And the first of these goes, here's to you, our absent friends, in the hopes that they, wherever they are, are drinking to us. Cheers, bro, I'll drink to that.